Wizards of the Coast, Warner Bros., Disney, Sony, Bethesda, the list goes on and on. Bryn Matheny is a top reference when it comes to animal and creature design, world building, and anatomy. When everyone told her to broaden her focus, she chose to keep it on what she loved the most. I'm sure Dungeons and Dragons is thankful for that. I sure am. You can find more of Bryn's artwork at brynart.com, but for now, join us as we discuss how to fight social media toxicity, why stories are essential to humanity, how to avoid the art downward spiral, and the best kept secret to unlock the special skill, draw all animals. Want to be part of the show? Then send in your questions or topics you'd like to see covered to our email at hello at etcherlab.com. If you send us an audio recording, we might include it in the episode. Hi, I'm Manya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etcher, meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. Okay, Bryn, I would love for you to tell us the first time you fell in love with art. Do you remember? Huh. Okay. So when I was a kid, I was really big into animals. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was in like okay. the first grade. Um, and I'm not sure who got it for me. It might have been one of my aunts or my parents, but I received a book that was called How to Draw Big Cats. Oh. And I can like send you a photo of it. I still have it. And it is um, just a, like a how-to drawing book. It's not, you know, anything crazy. It's like circles and then like shapes and then you shade it, you know, <laughs> it's like very basic. But but the artist himself was actually like a really wonderful artist and he had beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. But I remember looking through this book and kind of seeing how it was broken down. And my dad is an artist. So it was one of the activities that we kind of did a little bit here and there together mm -hmm. whenever we were able to. But um I think that was where my like I would say my first love which is animals and my second love of art kind of collided and it became magical for me because I was able to like express a love of nature through art and so then it, then I was hooked and I I just kind of started out by tracing all of the cats in that book and then eventually memorized how to do those motions and learn how to draw <laughs> so animals first art second you never strayed away from creatures then you just became more and more focused yeah i think so i um was just really obsessed with animals and then i think a, a big extension of that was disney cartoons hmm. and so because there were so many animal characters in that you know universe or that franchise but brand in mm -hmm. that brand and so um jumping from like realistic animal drawing or what I was trying to do mm -hmm. <laughs> in realistic animal drawing as a third grader and then um tracing and drawing Disney characters and other cartoon characters really taught me you know economy and design principles mm -hmm. I didn't really know what was going on but I was I just like drawing them because I knew the characters but I was learning how to simplify forms to make them effective. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of led me down that pretty specialized path. But I've, I've always drawn animals. I've never not drawn them. Um, and I've always been pretty obsessed with them. So it's, I think it just kind of is like a, a lifelong fascination and obsession that I can't quit. Like it's a little bit of a, a, an itch you can't scratch mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing. That makes sense. Yeah, I was wondering, because yeah. that, that was my next question for you, then why, why animals and creatures? That makes a lot of sense. When I was a little kid, I used to do <laughs> horse riding, and I loved to draw horses all the time. I was always, always, always drawing horses. But eventually, I don't know when it happened, if it was when I stopped doing horse riding or not, I stopped drawing horses altogether, but I continued to draw other things. So for me, it was like drawing was most important part of the whole thing and horses came second and horses was replaced so for you it looks to me like it's the opposite it was animals and then drawing came along and I'm assuming that other forms of art would be applicable to animals because you also do uh, 3d stuff right 
Yes, I do. I well, I've been learning 3D. So I um, I work in film as a concept artist, and part of my job, which is kind of not really common, but I do a lot of consulting also hmm. on projects. So once I've concepted the creature, I've been kept on projects to consult on that creature through modeling and animation to make sure that it stays the way we intended. Um, because I, I typically have a p very particular vision and um, I do a lot of writing and world building around these things. So I think the directors are usually kind of interested in keeping me on for that sort of skill set. So the um, 3D aspect has become kind of a necessary thing to learn from me recently mm -hmm. because I am wanting to be a more effective consultant and um, provide model feedback that is in program and whatnot. Because right now I'm doing paint overs and stuff like that, which is, is still effective, but it's um, it would be really nice to just get into ZBrush and adjust the model if I need to, or even just sculpt it myself and hand it off to be finished and that kind of thing. So I'm da dabbling a bit in 3D, which I'm really excited about. It's a ton of fun. It's kind of like, it's kind of like 3D drawing. So there's not a lot of difference there with mm -hmm. ZBrush. It's really just kind of learning the UI. And then once you, once you get past that beast, you can, you can really have some fun. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just adding new ingredients to a chef's <clears throat> table, basically, as, as long as you understand exactly. how the ingredient works. You can cook it because you know how to cook, kind of. I hope I'm not offending any professional exactly. cook with this metaphor. I'm sorry about that if I am, <laughs> but I don't know. Kind of makes sense to me. <laughs> no, I think it. I think it definitely applies. It's like it. Once you know how to draw, once you know how to draw a variety of animals, you can do, design a creature. And once you know how to design a creature, especially in 2D, you could probably jump into 3D or vice versa. Even if you start in 3D, you can jump back into 2D. It's all just a matter of practicing it and taking time to to learn it and mm -hmm. you know take some carry over those principles into the new medium or the new workspace what so. kind of consulting do you do uh so i'm mostly focused on um, anatomy really mm -hmm. is what i typically will do so because concepting doesn't really stop with the concept it typically keeps going as the creature enters the 3d realm and the director sees it and wants adjustments and all that and sees what's possible the design will inevitably change according to the modeler's tastes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the anatomy of the original concept can get lost in that. So I'm there to really just make sure that it stays true. But yeah, so I'm mostly focusing on anatomy. And uh, yeah, I know when I, when I talk to a bunch of art friends, they, we have a very, this conversation shows up often, which is, you know, art is a vague word. It's, there are so many forms of art and even in visual art in either be traditional or digital, we're not even going to go that route. Um, we can do so many things. You are a professional artist in the animation industry and you are very, very specialized in creature uh, design. And that's very, 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 very specific. And people go to you because you are the go-to person for that thing. Was that ever, I mean, how did you get to that position and was it ever something that you were worried about doing because it's too specialist or yeah just tell me about it yeah I mean absolutely because I I think the biggest the biggest like feedback I got as a student and as an early artist always was like you need to broaden out more you need to draw more robots you need to put weapons yeah. in your portfolio <laughs> but like you know do environments that kind of thing so like have a range and I that's correct. Like, there's never really a wrong way to enter this or do this at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I had something that I could offer the industry that was needed. And that was an eye for anatomy, um, animal knowledge and world building skills. Because a lot of, um, it's just, it's just kind of uncommon to have all that in, in a package, I guess. And there's a lot of, you know, with the rise of sci-fi and fantasy, um, when I was in like, high school, Lord of the Rings came out. So mm -hmm. I kind of saw this like door in a way, in college anyway, where I was like, well, this is becoming more and more common. And like, you know, TV shows are starting to happen. Um, and there's so much media that needs creatures and animals and computer animation is becoming more accessible and faster and, and like better. And so 
I really saw this kind of opportunity to pursue it and to just stay the course. Mm -hmm. And that meant also that like, I wasn't hired a lot in the beginning. Like a lot of my jobs in the beginning were not creature design, but I just never really told anybody about them. Mm. (laughs) So I did like mobile games and like, you know, drawing or, um, book I see book publishing stuff um sometimes a lot of it wasn't creature oriented Mm -hmm. um I did you know a lot of like um editorial work so it wasn't really creature based but I never showed anyone that work as portfolio work I just kept my portfolio as what I wanted to be and I got the client experience doing jobs that weren't really creature related Mm -hmm. so I was able to say like oh I've worked for wired magazine and you know dungeons and dragons and all these things and so i had the client list Mm -hmm. and people look at that and assume oh well she's a creature artist doing work for those they're not gonna go look it up so interesting like a little bit so i was kind of like yeah i'm a creature artist and these are the clients i've worked for so i think that most clients from there have assumed that i've always done creature and i pretty much have but there's also a period of time where i wasn't at all so um and now it's it's kind of you know when you work in film and some of these other highly collaborative projects you know knowing a production designer or being able to work with some of these people they'll usually call you back because they know that they can rely on you and Mm -hmm. go to hell with you and come out on the other side Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how it keeps going is that like I've worked with a handful of people and I typically will work with them quite a quite a bit again so yeah it's it's been kind of a a treacherous road I was definitely told that it would not be possible and that I was um limiting my like opportunities mm-hmm. um but I just was I'm a very stubborn person and I don't listen so I think that that kind of helped a little bit um because I knew I just knew I was like no I, I really think I can do this though <laughs> And if it's truly what you love, you know, I interviewed this uh, artist a long time ago, Kathleen Newman, and she said something that really resonated with me. Um, she's She's been an artist for decades, you know, at the time that being an artist was even harder than it is now because the animation industry and the opportunities are not what they are right now. And even now it's hard, but let alone like, you know, 40 years ago or something. Yeah. And, and she said... Oh yeah, and, and she said something along the lines of, I, I, I'm probably quoting her, go to her episode, guys, and, and listen to the interview, uh, but, and the link it will be on the post associated with this episode, by the way, um, but um, yeah, she said something along the lines of, if I, what I truly love is to be an artist, and some people can do it, then why not me? And if it's what I'm truly right. happy doing, then to hell with it, I'll just do the best I can, and I'll do it. If others can, why cannot? Why, why can't I, you know, I, I love it. I, right. I don't, I, I'm going to go at it. And, and she worked and worked and worked and worked. My God, that woman is so inspiring and she did it and she's doing it. And she's a, a master. She's amazing. So awesome. yeah, the yeah, world is filled with people that tell us what we can't do. <laughs> yeah. And I, I never really, but maybe in the same time, I was like really bent on proving them wrong. I think a little mm. bit, cause I was like, I think I can really do this and you know I, I I got a lot of pushback but you know it, it worked out it's working somehow <laughs> so yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense that you did not add the work you did that was not creature related to your portfolio because that would probably fetch you work that is not creature related which is not the direction you want to go right yes and I I was very adamant about like no I mean I I like drawing human characters and I have quite a bit in you know, especially in recent movie jobs, they're kind of creature-y, but they're still human mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way. Um, but they, uh, but I, I never wanted to be like, you know, oh, here's like the weapons page and here's the robot page because I, I'm not good at that. I'm just, I don't have the brain for it. And I would much rather recommend the five people that I know who were great at it and, mm-hmm. and add something to the industry that's like valuable and interesting and maybe someone that that the director or the production designer doesn't know, you know, mm-hmm. to make things more inclusive and awesome. But I, um, I just never really felt like it was for me. And I, I think that it kind of just depends on the artist and like what your strengths are. If you feel like you're really good at something specialized, then 
lean in. And if you feel like you want to draw everything, then go that route. It's kind of, you know, really what you want to be doing because I guarantee you, if you put something you're not excited about in your portfolio, that's what you're going to get work for. <laughs> you're oh going to hate goodness. your job. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I've seen that so many times. Yeah. I have a tricky question for you. Why art? That is a tricky question. Um, gosh, I think it's because <sighs> there's a few reasons. One, I think it's because I can be my own boss. Um, I've, I really like working for myself and being in charge of a lot of projects and kind of being on my own. Um, mm -hmm. I like, I like working for like companies here and there, but only if I can see like an end in sight, I just kind of, you know, I, I like to work on multiple projects and, and whatnot. Um, so there's that aspect and that's, that's kind of shifting a little bit. I'm starting to get to a point now where I would like to have a little more of like a stable office job or something, maybe like doing art direction or even producing or something like that would be really, mm -hmm. really great. Um, because I, I like facilitating people also, but I think the other reason I like, or art is, you know, why art would be a uh, story. I really like mm -hmm. telling stories. And it's a good way for me to do that um, and like comment on my experience or how I, my experience particularly toward nature is really important to me and being able to communicate that in a way that a lot of people can digest mm -hmm. is um, really fulfilling because I, I can draw like a silly little doodle of like two little chubby creatures fighting and everyone you know, gets excited because they're like, I've seen this, my, my dogs do this, or I saw two rabbits doing this. And it's like oh, that wonderful. moment where people are, yeah. And it's this like, I can connect to people and, and also get them to think about something in nature that they love. And yeah. that's really what I'm really, I think like my, like purpose I'm trying to push for more these days is like, how can I pull you back to that childhood memory of seeing an animal for the first time? Wow. Yeah, that is beautiful. I was uh, reading this book the other day and it was saying that the most basic desire or need of humans is the need of belonging. That's our, like, the, oh, the, yes. the pillar of our foundation is we need to feel like we belong somewhere with someone, part of a yeah. tribe. And yeah. I don't know, I feel like stories are have such a vital part to play on that you know the stories we tell each other or the stories we tell others even when you know ages ago stories that are what kept us alive what kept mm -hmm. us not eating poison mushrooms of the floor because our grandmother's <laughs> grandmothers told us that that color is dangerous so yeah it's very true i think that there's a lot of truth to that in in belonging you want to feel like you can rely on your family or friends or whoever that is, you know, it's really important. Yeah. Stories do have a magical way of bringing us together, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you are creating stories with your amazing gift and creatures because oh, they're amazing. Very sweet. Thanks. A little earlier in this interview, you were talking about when you started doing creature design, you started with simplifying shapes, you know, that book with drawing cats that you mentioned and how, you know, mm -hmm. you simplify shapes to get more complex uh, things drawn. So can you expand a little bit on that? I'm just thinking about our audience who, you know, are trying to start doing some creatures and how, how do we even start doing that? Because, you know, it's anatomy and anatomy is oh so scary. Yeah, it can be overwhelming. And I think that um, especially as students and even myself, when I was a student, I was so eager to learn all the names and all the details <laughs> about anatomy and like get right into all the nitty gritty things. And I think one of my favorite teachers in college, his name was Mark Eanes. He um, was my anatomy teacher at CCA. And I also was taught by um, Marjan Hermosi. She was my anatomy teacher at um, the Art Institute when I was there for a moment. She's great. They're both great. They were really good at simplifying forms and grouping things together. So they were easier to digest in the beginning. So you could really get the like gesture and the, and the structure down first. And 
what Mark really talked about a lot was seeing things with a planar view. So really trying to imagine the shapes or the body that you're drawing as simplified 3D shapes. So like cylinders, cubes, um, spheres, that kind of thing. Kind of like if you were to make it out of, of like wooden blocks, like what would it look like? Mm -hmm. And that can really help with like plane changes and like perspective and where mm -hmm. the form is turning and how things are coming at you or going away from you. And using contour lines and, and whatnot to kind of wrap lines around the forms can really help with like just getting down the basic forms. Um, so seeing it general to specific was his mantra. And I really hold that so dear because it mm -hmm. is such a good mantra um, in like getting used to drawing your general form first and then getting specific after that. So if you're designing a creature, it's a good idea to, to think about and write down. I do a lot of writing when I design. Mm -hmm. Think about like, what is it you're designing? So that way you have a roadmap, like where does it live? What does it eat? You know, how big is it? Is it a male or female or neither? You know, what does it, mm -hmm. what does it do? Like what, what's its story basically? And then from there you can start to like find reference and brainstorm ideas about what it might need to look like to survive mm -hmm. in the environment that it lives in. And then you can start to do that sketching and that scribbling and some of those general explorations. And I think something that, um, Marjan taught me was that she was very good about structure and the like construction lines and framework that makes an animal or a, a human work. Um, and human anatomy, you know, obviously flows right into animal anatomy because we're vertebrates and we share the same skeletal structures as a lot of animals on earth. So if you can draw a human, you can, you can draw mm -hmm. an animal, but, um, we can talk about more, more about that later too. Mm -hmm. But the, um, her principles were really like, show the framework, draw the wireframe, make sure you know where the skeleton is and find the landmarks and those elbows and knees, you know, that kind of thing. Um, she was training animators primarily. So she knew that there would need to be a rig in anything that you would design. Okay. And clearly so that structure and having like, you know, those joints and those landmarks be really apparent is really mm -hmm. good for not just like, being clear in a design of a of an alien life form that any person needs to look at and understand, but also for your animator who needs to animate it. So mm -hmm. yeah. that it was a very sense. long answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm thinking it makes a lot of sense. I, I was like picturing okay. all the the stuff out here where you're saying everything. And yeah, I would love for you to expand a little bit more on if you can draw a human, you can draw any animal. I would love to hear more about that. Yes, that's true. So um, if you think about the skeleton our skeleton and you think about like a cow skeleton or a dog skeleton or a dolphin mm -hmm. skeleton any other animal with a skeleton they're all the same they okay. all have the same bones going on they've just been stretched or excluded or um, proportioned in different ways so mm -hmm. uh, even if you know if you're a student right now listening to this or just anyone who's interested in anatomy if you type in comparative anatomy into google you'll get tons of diagrams of like a human arm compared to a bird arm compared to a dog arm, you know, hmm. and it will show you like usually color coded what that looks like, like what each bone is equivalent to the other animal. So like, this is our scapula and this is what a dog's scapula looks like. And this is our humerus and this is what their humerus looks like. And it's all pretty much the same, like the, you know, common ancestor that we had that like dragged itself on land all that time ago had that framework there and a lot of the bony fishes that led to it have the same sort of structural and skeletal um, structure that we do it's just huh. arranged in a different way so that said if you follow those principles and know that like the femur will probably be encased you know your, your leg bone basically your thigh bone will be encased in thigh muscles you could probably generally draw a thigh depending like there's a knee at the bottom and there's a a mm -hmm. hip joint or a great trochanter at top and you know that in between those two landmarks there's a bunch of muscle and the you know shape of that muscle varies between species to species but once you know all those like you know big landmarks and those big muscle groups you can proportion them in any way possible and so then you have all the power to kind of draw any vertebrate ever as long as you just remember you know like one bone two bones many bones a famous scientist said that. I don't know his name, and I'm sorry. 
<laughs> but um, if you type it in, you'll find it. <laughs> Credit to him. I did not come up with that, but it's common. So, and then, I mean, invertebrates, you know, the other side of animal kingdom, like crabs and, you know, octopus and all these other kinds of animals. Mm-hmm. Once you are able to, you know, harness the power of like planar drawing, planar shapes, contour, and like, simplifying shapes those animals become extremely you know accessible to draw because really a crab is just like kind of a flattened cylinder and more cylinders and maybe a few cubes here and there and you can you can get the basic gist of it and then kind of refine it and you've got yourself a crab so any insect is pretty approachable um, with some practice because it's it's kind of like already put together like a like a wooden toy it's just a little there's some spines here and there it can look huh. kind of intimidating but all from the same spot i never thought it about it that way that's very interesting and will you will you show that <laughs> visually to us when we do the live demo on november 20th checking my calendar yes 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 uh yeah. i think that would be extremely valuable so probably what i'll do is i'll i'll have like a a diagram of a horse or something, whatever creature we decide to explore, mm-hmm. some animal that's close to it, mm-hmm. and a human, and then I can kind of go through with some markers and sort of color code some of the areas of the body that are similar, so that way you can start to think it, or think in that, in that way. <laughs> okay, if you're listening to this before November 20th, great news, we are going live, Bryn is doing a free live demo on our Etcher YouTube channel, link to that will be on the post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash Bryn and you should check it out because uh, as you can see you're going to learn the one thing like the Rosetta tablet of language but for anatomy <laughs> and uh, I feel like I'm going to handle the key to this world to rule the world the one ring to rule them all okay one anatomy trick we okay this is going to be fun if you are listening to this after november 20th do not fret everything is recorded uh but we might have sold out uh the mini workshop that bernie is going to teach so check that out as well everything every link will be on the post associated with this uh episode okay um so one other thing that i had in mind you have mm-hmm. a long career you've been painting for a long while you are a master of what you do thinking back at those early stages when you were starting to do everything do you remember the biggest art struggle you had and how you overcame it yes it was probably well it was, i think it might have been two things um i think one was thinking that i needed to be like a really painterly painter at hmm. first i was really i was really like because I was at the time I was trying to get into Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering and all that. And so much of that work is, is like this just gorgeous oil kind of buttery painting. And I was like, I can't do this. I just can't do it. At the time I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so I, I really tried to push into that very hard and was just failing left and right and was getting really burnt out on everything because I was just not, you know, I was, I didn't like any of the work I was making. So instead I kind of went back to square one and just sort of revisited drawing in a, in a very meaningful way and really leaned in again to like, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to be the person that maybe one day, you know, Dungeons and Dragons will come to for like anatomy and like, you Mm -hmm. know, a scientific drawing of an owlbear or something. Um, and then they did, which is insane, but they, um, that was probably one of the biggest like art actual art struggles that I had was just trying to like be okay with my strengths and my identity Mm -hmm. Um, because we're all kind of good at something, but then there's always this like, this like dream of like, Oh, I wish I could do that though. I wish I could paint like this or I wish I could draw like that, you know? And I think trying to be a little more like, you know what? It's okay that I, that that's not me. I need to figure out what me is is kind of the one of the biggest hurdles and then i think something else that i really struggled with that i think is really important to talk about in for artists starting out or or um aspiring artists is time management and like Mm. 
care <laughs> was really helpful <laughs> in the beginning and boundaries between myself and my work mm-hmm. um having having a life I was very um antisocial and like wouldn't I didn't see anybody that I knew for like years wow. and it was just horrible wow. um it was bad and uh not a good time and I um eventually learned that fostering relationships and having time away from my work mm-hmm. and absorbing the world and um you know having these moments of like relaxation mm-hmm. actually made me more productive than mm-hmm. just sitting at my desk and worrying for 16 hours a day because I actually didn't do any work I just sat there and burning stressed. out yeah yeah burning on empty. exactly mm-hmm and so it's really important to do that. And it, it doesn't have to be anything extravagant. It can be small things for yourself, like cooking yourself a meal or taking the time to do a nice facial for yourself or even just like watching your favorite show. Like I wouldn't watch anything because I was like, oh, I have to be doing art all the time. Yeah, wasting you know, time, like wasting being... time. I'll never get anywhere. Yeah, it was like such a bummer. And so um I think like I and it's hard because I, 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 you know, said this a lot to folks and I think that there's always this kind of question where it's like, you know, well, do you think you'd get to where you are today if you if you actually followed that mm. advice? You never know. I did. Yeah. And that's the thing is I'll, I'll never know. But I, I might have been more intact as a human at the end of it, which I've had to do a lot of rebuilding in that way. And it's it's, it's been hard. rough. It's hard. And so it's not worth it in the end of, at the end of the day. I think it's more worth it to get there a little slower, slower, and healthier, um, and be health, yeah, and not have to like rebuild yourself as a person. <laughs> Thank you. That is very meaningful comments on part one. You know, I I don't think I mentioned this in any podcast episode. If I did, and you have heard it, I apologize. So there was this commercial. I forgot what brand it was, but it was a really good commercial about. Um, per- how we perceive ourselves i think it was dove like some kind of facial cream i don't know but anyway they were asking all all of these adults what they would change in themselves and everybody said something like i would like my nose to be smaller or i would like to be taller or not have as many freckles or have longer not longer hair because you can't you can't change that things that you cannot change you know that that are inherently yours you know i'd love to have blue eyes i'd love to i don't know thinner lips fuller lips whatever things that you did not have because we always want what you do not have and then they ask children what they wanted to have different about their, themselves their bodies and their answers were like i'd like to have sheeta legs so i could run super fast i'd like to have wings so i could fly through the skies i'd like to have big teeth so i could eat more and faster and i'm like when did that change you know yeah, yeah, exactly. what happened yeah. and i think that is exactly the same that is happening to artists when we are constantly comparing ourselves to everybody else who we perceive are better than us i'm not saying they are i'm not saying they aren't you know people there will always be someone better and someone worse than you it's it's how things are and yeah. it's like why why are we and I'm, I'm saying that like i'm not affected by it i am you know i've, I've been through it sometimes right. i find myself in Same. that uh, loophole and i try to get out of it i try to catch myself but it doesn't help anyone and i i try to do like realism drawing once and and this creature stuff and i was dreading drawing and i'm like i don't like drawing anymore it turns out i was not enjoying drawing that thing and then I turned to something else, right. like children's books, and I loved it. And I miss drawing because I'm having fun with what I do. I'm, I'm, and I'm like, sometimes I think, oh, I should be, you know, working on my anatomy a little bit better so I can improve my drawing. And that's fine, you know, if if my mm. purpose is to publish a book one day, and there are some things that I have to build on fundamentally. That's totally part of, you know, being a professional at being an artist. But if you're not having fun, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then what is the purpose? You know, we're like exactly. those adults that don't want as many freckles or don't want to have blue eyes or uh, want whatever they don't have. It's like, what do you want for a snack? What do we have at home? We have bananas, we have um, this and we have that. I oh, mean, we don't have apples. I would truly love an apple. Next day, what do you want for a <laughs> snack? I want a banana. Oh, we ran out of bananas, but I bought apples. I'm like, ah, but I want bananas, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's, it's one of those things that, I mean, I struggle with it too. Just like you said, it's, I'm always, you know, especially, and I think social media plays a lot into that where (laughs) you see just so much beautiful artwork and 
all these amazing approaches and ideas. And, and I just think to myself, like, God, I wish I could just, you know, have, have that skill or think like that or have that sensibility or whatever. And, you know, my art is like this, it's not enough of this, it's whatever. And I, I absolutely get down on myself sometimes. And I've, but I found that one way to help combat it is um, to share the work that, that I like, like, or that mm -hmm. I am, you know, in, like intimidated or not even intimidated, but just like um, envious of or whatever it is. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I wish I could do that. But you know what? I love it so much. I'm going to share it because I want other people to see it. And so that's kind of been my, my like thing lately where it's like, oh, I really wish I could draw like that. You know what though? It's cool. I'm just going to share it so other people can see it. Yeah. Cause I, I, it's toxic. It's so toxic. And I think that as a young artist, I really struggled with jealousy mm -hmm. and wanting to, to like kind of get to the front of the line and like, oh, how do I, how do I like get there? And, and it's, I found that the moment I kind of let that go, I wasn't even making it. I didn't have any jobs or anything. Yeah. It wasn't like, and then I made it and everything was great. It was like, it was in the middle of like the darkest hour. And I was like, I need to stop doing this. This sucks. And I just remember being like, I'm going to start encouraging people and sharing work and telling people that I love their work when I, when I, when I see it and I'm like, you know, I feel like jealous of it and it, it completely changed everything. It really things. helped because I, now I'm just like, Oh, this is awesome. Like, I love all of this. This is so great. And now I, I even now it's like, Oh, and I can recommend everybody you know, and like make the art world better because I know all these amazing artists that I found and I can push them to places where maybe they can get work, you know? So yeah, it's important to, to try to, to combat that because it's, it it's is. hard for young artists. And think, kindness yeah. is contagious. It's not just toxicity that is. Toxicity is highly yes. contagious, but kindness is too. So if we combat toxicity with kindness and positivity, we can truly, I believe we can make a dent in this near rotten world and make it much better, you know? Absolutely. And I, I believe that too, because I think that um, you'll never, you never really know how much like you sharing what you think about someone's work means. Yeah. They could be try on the verge of giving up or, you know, whatever. And if you were just to be like, oh, I really love this and how you handled this. It's just so beautiful. I mean, man, how nice is so that? True. And then and then you've made someone stay really great. So yeah, and it does, didn't cost anything. Yeah, exactly. And then and then you're fulfilled, too, by having that moment of like connection and like goodness. And it's like you you feel more motivated then to make to make work. And I think that it's. Um, it's just it's just better than being envious and like you know <laughs> wanting to like destroy everyone yeah. it's not i've been there it's not productive yeah. <laughs> don't go down that route <laughs> yeah let's let's go on the route of chain of kindness and it is and it's so true yes. you know the, the, so. the amount of days that have been brightened just because someone took two minutes to write me a nice email and when you try yeah. to spread yeah. toxicity you get sour yourself because you're having all these dark emotions but when you're kindness is something that you know once you give it to someone you feel it in your bones you feel better the other person feels better the other person because they feel better feel more you know it's easier for them to be kind to someone else and it just keeps on spreading and it's yes. and you could you could truly stop someone from just not drawing anymore yeah exactly it's amazing. exactly and that's a wrap if you'd like to learn from Bryn, please join us this Friday, the 20th of November, for a free live demo. Find the link for that and everything else mentioned in this episode at etherlab.com forward slash Bryn. That's E T C H R L A B dot com forward slash B R Y double N. Like the podcast? Help us support the show by subscribing and giving us a five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab.com forward slash go forward slash Apple. See you in the next episode and until then, let's make more art. <laughs>